Welcome. Today we will be hearing from Paul Martini from Newport Consulting on Integrated Distribution System and Grid Modernization Planning. Take it away, Paul. Thanks, Carrie. Today what we're going to start off with is zeroing in on that bubble that uh, says reliability and resilience. And in particular, we're going to focus on the resilience dimension and how increasingly we're thinking about uh, incorporating resilience planning uh, for distribution systems uh, into the overall process and, and why that matters. Next slide, please. So one way that we might think about uh, reliability and resilience, because often these terms get used and there's a fair amount of confusion sometimes in the way that we you know, discuss them. Uh, you know, there's a variety of ways, as I said, to, uh, to describe it. One way that um, uh, an effort that uh, the Office of Electricity has been pursuing uh, on distribution resilience is to, to, to think about this as a continuum. Um, uh, that is, reliability events uh, are of shorter duration uh, and uh, of a smaller impact. Uh, this is consistent with an IEEE standard, uh, 1366. Uh, the, uh, the metrics that we commonly use for reliability are part of that standard, the KD and SADI and, and the like, the you know, assessing system uh, average uh, outages and customer uh, average outage uh, indexes and the like. Um, and so that's what's represented in that gray box down on the lower, lower left. And as we think about the space in the blue part of the box, that is to the uh, to the uh, to the right, that is longer durations beyond 24 hours, and certainly uh, major events as as defined uh, in the IEEE standard. Uh, we uh, we now think about those as uh, essentially re resilience events, and as we know, uh, the economic and social impact from an event uh, is, uh, increases substantially uh, with longer duration, and certainly with a greater uh, geographic impact, number of customers impacted uh, uh, over that uh, time period as well. So we have this exponential curve representing uh, conceptually the economic and social impact. So as we think about this domain of reliability and resilience, it becomes clear that these things um, are, are related in the sense of how we think about what needs to be done. How do we think about, uh, you know, both hardening, but also uh, other things that we might do to uh, improve the, the the ability of the system to uh, to, to cope with these kinds of events. Um, as is noted in this slide, there's a lot of words in the slide, I apologize for that, uh, but the, it's, uh, it's clear as we think about um, the individual elements that start to break in, uh, in an event, whether it's a reliability event or resilience event, uh, we're talking about things like wire down and poles broken, uh, transformer failures, uh, fuses that may blow, other devices in the basic poles and wires, physical infrastructure that start to fail. And largely we're dealing with a larger scale of those kinds of, of uh, failures uh, that we then have to deal with after a large uh, major event that might be a hurricane or, uh, or other, uh, you know, very large uh, impact event. Next slide, please. But another dimension that we might want to think about in this context is an architectural uh, version of resilience. And that is uh, the characteristic of a system in its ability to withstand an impact from uh, both physical threats, uh, as we tend to focus on, but also cybersecurity threats. And here, uh, from my colleague uh, Jeff Chap at, at PNNL, um, he, uh, we, we think about um, this idea of, of resilience as both uh, resisting stress on the system, and that's where hardness comes in or things like asset health, uh, which obviously ties into aging infrastructure, but also uh, strain compensation. That is the ability of the system to be able to, uh, you know, uh, to deal with uh, those impacts in terms of um, the, the stresses and strains that are put onto the system. Um, but as we think about this element, um, it means that we now need to think about it in, in investment planning for distribution to incorporate some form of grid architecture analysis as we think about the ability of the system to reconfigure, to, to deal with um, the impacts that may occur, uh, to develop systematically a, a more resilient system and, uh, and grid. And that may include uh, 
for example, elements that uh, involve customer-based solutions or third-party-based solutions, which, which may involve things like microgrids uh, or customer uh, backup generation and the like. So thinking about this holistically, how might we think about a, uh, a more uh, resilient uh, distribution system that links to you know, improving overall reliability at the same time? Next slide, please. So one of the things uh, that we think about in resilience and, and, resi and reliability planning from an overall standpoint, uh, not unlike what we talked about yesterday, and I'll come back to tying this into the overall process we discussed, but in the planning process, there are objectives and criteria uh, to think about how this then integrates into the various planning components. Uh, certainly, we look to identify solutions, uh, and then there's a solution prioritization, which includes looking at um, the effectiveness, looking at the engineering and economic effectiveness of the particular solutions. And then, um, as we know, if an event happens, uh, and in many cases, when an event will happen, um, there is some form of fault uh, isolation, and obviously in a major event, uh, in a resilience event, uh, we have many faults that happen, and they're quite large, and sometimes the only isolation that happens is that a very large-scale, you know, blackout uh, uh, for, you know, whether we're talking about a, a larger geographic area or, uh, it, you know, a smaller area, but still could be quite large relative to what we think about in a, in a reliability event where maybe we just have a car pole accident and you just have, you know, one street out. Um, and then, of course, we have the outage um, that these things go on at the same time. And then there's a recovery process that happens. And then after the event, there's usually a form of post-event evaluation to consider how, what might be needed to uh, improve the overall resilience uh, going forward, whether we're talking about in the operational mode or in the planning mode uh, of this process and the, and the kinds of investments that might be uh, needed. In the, and today, we're going to focus on the planning part of this process and, and how it ties into the overall annual distribution planning and the longer term uh, distribution planning we discussed yesterday. Uh, but uh, there are some different things that uh, methods and capabilities to address the variation and complexity of the kinds of events that we might have to plan for. Next slide, please. So yesterday we showed this diagram uh, that's on the right-hand side of the planning process, and there's a, a couple of new uh, boxes added trying to illustrate where uh, and how those elements that I just showed you on the prior slide for resilience planning fit within this, uh, this uh, the set of boxes that we in process for integrated distribution planning. So the obvious ones that you'll jump out at you are the blue ones that from the prior slide where it broke up that process and, and showed where they fit in the sequence. So objectives and criteria um, uh, may be quite clear that it fits into the, the overall um, you know, criteria and planning needs and policy objectives, uh, those three bubbles plus cover, uh, sorry, customer needs that we uh, talked about at the outset, that Venn diagram. So those all, you know, fit into there. Um, there was this uh, threat assessment, and that's part of the integrated planning, and we'll go into that a little bit more, but threat assessments are a pretty important component uh, within the resilience process is one of the first things is trying to really understand what are the potential uh, threats that may be uh, in, involved in your particular area. Uh, obviously, hurricanes are a big concern, but there are other concern, considerations like floods. Uh, and in other places of the country, you might have things like um, ice storms or, uh, as in the case of California, you know, wildfires. But uh, there's a variety of threats that may occur and you really want to identify those and, and think about them. And we'll talk a little more about that. Cyber threats also are a consideration, uh, whether you know, uh, inadvertent human uh, or uh, things like nation state uh, cyber threats. Um, and then of course, identify solutions and solution prioritization. Um, that fits into this last part of the process where we're looking at you know, what are the grid modernization and distribution investments that, that may be needed uh, to, you know, support and improve uh, resilience? So those factor in too. And much as uh, was touched on yesterday, when we think about uh, sourcing other uh, options from customers or third parties for uh, improving resilience, 
Uh, likewise here, we have microgrid initiatives uh, and we'll touch on that as well, but there are options for looking at how, uh, whether it's a microgrid or whether we're talking about, um, you know, what customers' actions might be on backup generation or policies towards that, uh, as we've seen in several states like Florida and Texas, uh, where there've been um, legislation about uh, requiring customers of a certain size to have and type to have backup generation. Uh, those fit into that process, uh, part of the process to understand. And then, of course, um, we need to know what those are, those choices are, or policies uh, that feed into the scenarios uh, and system forecasts. Uh, so that other purple, light purple box at the top, those that also needs to fit into this overall process. So as you can see, resilience touches on a number of key parts of this overall planning process and, and really, as opposed to being a separate thing, uh, is best to be thought of as a process that needs to feed into the annual and long-term planning process. Often it may just touch on the distribution asset management piece, which is down at the bottom uh, of the, uh, the blue uh, box in the, uh, in the diagram. Uh, and that, that's, that's good. I mean, it's important that that's there for things like hardening. But as we think about more holistically the options and what customers are doing independently in terms of improving their own resilience, uh, we need to take that into account as we think about the overall system plan. Uh, next slide. So, I, uh, Carrie, are we doing the, I can't recall, are we doing the pop-up here or after this one? Uh, I think it was after slide seven. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, as I was talking about, uh, the first thing you want to think about is looking at the, the various threats that you may uh, encounter uh, in your area, uh, and very specific to your area. Uh, uh, thank you, Carrie or uh, Lisa, for pointing that out. So this is an example, uh, just to, to give you a sense, in Hawaii, uh, after Puerto Rico's experience, uh, the state of Hawaii uh, brought a number of key stakeholders, both state agencies uh, and, and local uh, city and county officials and, uh, and Hawaiian Electric, the, the local utility, uh, to really sit down and think through what are all the uh, potential threats and what are the potential impacts. And then they started going through a ranking process. And as you can see here, there's a number of things that they see as um, high on their list. It's gonna be different in different places. Uh, but you can see there's a fairly wide range of things that, um, that are involved in terms of thinking about their potential impact uh, and then, you know, as a, as a way to start. There are a number of processes. Um, there's, a, there's a good process underway that uh, Bobby Jeffers, uh, through the Department of Energy, a, 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 a GMLC project, has an initiative underway that is really uh, taking some of these ideas. There's a good handbook out. Uh, but one of the national labs, it talks about how you do threat ana uh, analysis in and, and quite detail. So there's a number of good resources here to help you uh, walk through that if, if, uh, uh, if that's something that is, is uh, useful for you. Um, but it's really important and integral to understanding the potential impacts. Um, the thing to, to note is, as you can see, there's a, a wide range of potential impacts in any particular area. Each will have its own, uh, you know, uh, uh, cause different uh, considerations for when we think about the dis distribution system. They will also have different scales. Uh, and what I mean by scope is the potential for, you know, the damage uh, scale, meaning how many customers may be impacted, how, how big a geographic area within, you know, uh, within a particular utilities uh, service territory or over multiple utilities service territories in, in your particular state as the case may be. So um, the scale and scopes can be quite different. And that's what's illustrated in that lower box, which is as we think about resilience events, there really isn't any, you know, there's not a generic version of that. Um, so we can have a very localized event. We can have a much, you know, something that's larger, but still within a, a more localized. And then we can have a, a regional event that is cutting across multiple states, as we've seen uh, with some, uh, some of the more recent, very intense uh, hurricanes. So. Um, really understanding what that uh, impact is is going to be uh, important, but also recognizing there's going to be a difference. Um, as we zoom into the distribution system, it's really going to be in, uh, important to unpack what that means for any of those types of events on a particular uh, 
distribution system, um, as each distribution system will have its own unique characteristics, uh, the nature of the grid failures that may occur and the, and the, and the potential for thinking about different structural uh, uh, changes, that is design options to think about is there a way to change the design of the distribution system to be able to be more resistant to uh, these types of events uh, is an important consideration uh, beyond obviously hardening but are there other things that might be you know, might be done so uh, that's how this gets factored in uh, an important takeaway here is that there are no single set of distribution resilience planning criteria for any single utility and even within their system it might be quite different depending on whether we're talking about urban or rural uh, and uh, and so we need to really think uh, about how to approach this in uh, in kind of these multiple dimensions. So it's a little complex, but it's it's a way to kind of start to think about how I might approach uh, planning the and thinking about the the impact of resilience events. So with this, we'll do a pop up. So here, uh, the question is, resilience is different from reliability in, in which ways? Uh, one is severity of the event in terms of number of uh, customers and, and uh, system impacted and duration, uh, the ability to withstand cyber and physical threats, uh, potential impact on other critical infrastructure and essential services, essential services being like gas stations and, and grocery stores, or all of the above. We'll give everybody a moment to answer. All right, we're gonna close the poll. Great. Yeah, terrific. Uh, all of the above is, uh, is really the thing that uh, distinguishes it because we are looking to really think about both the severity, the ability to withstand those events and threats, uh, and uh, also the potential on impact on other critical facilities, uh, infrastructure, and essential services. Thank you. Next slide, please. So why are critical and essential services an important consideration when we think about distribution system planning, and, uh, and particularly for resilience? And the reason is, is that increasingly, or really uh, just from the outset, our society is largely dependent on electricity to, to function. Uh, our daily lives, uh, the businesses that we interact with, uh, certainly our gas stations and grocery stores, uh, but our water systems and uh, communications uh, all depend on electricity to, to function. And increasingly our transportation as there's a shift towards electri you know, electrification of transportation, uh, as we've seen in several states that have had a fair amount of adoption, like California most recently with the, the impacts last fall on uh, preventative power shutdowns for wildfires, uh, the impact of the loss of electricity for transportation was really uh, much better understood that it's becoming a really critical factor uh, to people's mobility if they need to get out of a particular area. So. As we think about the role that electricity plays as a lifeblood for our modern economy, it becomes quite important to think about that, uh, that interdependence of electricity on these various critical uh, systems. And so, um, so this becomes another dimension that really needs to be taken into account. As I mentioned, in a couple of states, um, the, the discussion about resilience uh, and thinking about threat assessment is not something that's done sort of in a silo within the utility, but rather something is done on a community basis and involving other critical stakeholders, depending on the nature and scale of the events that are being examined. Uh, so we'll talk more about that, and I know Joe's gonna get into that in more detail as well. Uh, but it's an important consideration to really think about the implication of electricity and the various community uh, impacts that it will have if, if we do lose electricity for multiple days, uh, or certainly beyond a day becomes um, really important. And of course, I think as we all know, in the United States on average, uh, you know, for the, the various distribution grids, uh, utility grids, um, the average the Department of Energy has is about uh, 30 years old. 
And typically, you know, the average asset life, although we all know that there are distribution components out much longer than that, uh, are about 40 years. Um, but it's an important consideration in many states. I'm sure many of yours, uh, there's been discussions about aging infrastructure and, and what do we need to do uh, about that in terms of replacement. It's the ideal time to be thinking about what improvements uh, to those to those uh, infrastructure to do to make them more resilient, not just hardening, but also are there opportunities to think about design considerations? Are there opportunities to think about automation that may be incorporated? If you're already going to be touching and replacing those poles uh, and wires, is there time to reduce the installation cost by also including uh, some other devices to help with resilience. So that's an important consideration as we think about optimizing uh, any expenditure that might be uh, desired. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there are a number of tools and methods that um, have been developed by the Department of Energy through the National Labs uh, and others that, uh, for example, EPRI and, and other, uh, other entities uh, that can be leveraged to think about this. In this case, uh, we're talking about really two two bodies of work. One is the grid architecture work that PNNL's put together uh, with a number of other folks as part of a GMLC effort, is thinking about these sort of structural improvements to improve resilience. Uh, and then the other, uh, building on the work that we did on the Modern Grid uh, Distribution Grid Report, or DSPX, uh, there are elements of that, uh, as we have been talking about, that can be incorporated in and thinking about the planning and uh, and uh, and how to optimize investment. Next slide, please. But it's important, as we showed yesterday, um, to really understand the sequence of how investments um, build upon each other, so that uh, you know the relationship to each. So we understand that uh, you know if you're looking for a particular uh, improvement on your overall system, you really need to think about. Uh, what those, uh, say in the case of advanced technology, how dependent upon that is on the prior decisions that were made uh, or ongoing decisions about the underlying infrastructure that those uh, you know, sit on top of, if you will. So in the case of, uh, of what we're looking at here, one way to think about uh, how uh, the different types of investments sort of feed into each other, uh, one of the things is if we think about the dark blue, the basic safety and reliability and resilience uh, in terms of hardening requirements really fit in this bottom level. So thinking of, you know, as we've been talking about, and I'm sure you're quite familiar, things like safety codes and co uh, co electrical code compliance, aging infrastructure replacement, those things really touch on that basic um, sort of from a Has Maslow's hierarchy, really that, that bottom, you know, uh, critical uh, layer. Then as we think about <laughs> moving up this uh, pyramid, um, we have design practices. How do we think about um, back ties? How do we think about contingent loading criteria? How do we think about other uh, other dimensions that we might think structurally about organizing the or changing the topology of the di distribution system um, to to improve its uh, its resilience uh, and reliability? Same thing with uh, distribution automation. Obviously, there are a number of technologies that can be incorporated to improve help improve that. Then as we start to move into more advanced um, technologies and control systems and protection systems, we can start to enhance that, uh, what was built on uh, underneath uh, by adding additional technologies that can uh, address that need, that's sort of that wider blue. And then there are things that can be done at the highest level uh, that start to enable, uh, obviously, DER utilization. But one of the things that fits in the DER utilization in this context are things like microgrids. So how do we think about customer or third-party microgrids and how do they become part of the mix uh, in thinking about resilience or even reliability and what are the technologies on the grid side that we need to be able to interface with us so we have this seamless um, islanding capability uh, with the overall grid in a coordinated fashion. Uh, next slide, please. Now, within, uh, uh, within what the... Uh, so that was sort of from a utility standpoint. Now, if we're going to zoom out and look at this uh, holistically and say, well, there are pieces of things uh, things we can do on the grid side, but there are also things that can be done on the customer side or what third parties might be able to bring, then there's also a range of solutions that, that can come from there. And if we look at the bottom of this um, uh, this uh, chart, 
you can see where it says safe and reliable distribution system. And I say see prior slide. So what this this arrow is representing is largely uh, a lot of what was represented on the prior slide. Um, there are some uh, distribution preventative measures as we talked about uh, on that prior slide as well. Um, but there, uh, there are also other things that uh, could be done uh, in, on the operational side, uh, expense side, like tree trimming and, and so on. But here, what I wanted to focus on is the upper three, where we start to think uh, quite differently about how we approach this. So just thinking about, uh, are, there, are there elements that we need to consider with respect to business, business continuity planning uh, for the utility, but also how does this tie into what uh, the other critical facilities need to be done? And what's the interdependency? Uh, what are the mutual aid plans uh, and so on? These are traditional sort of uh, preparedness that many of you in the Southeast have been doing for a number of years because of the, you know, the, the hurricane impacts that you've experienced over the years. So, uh, and, and by the way, the, the Southeast is the, the nation's leader in, in really thinking through these uh, response preparation. Uh, so I won't spend too much time on that. The, um, in terms of customer backup power, increasingly I think we're seeing large large numbers of customers. I mean, there's there's a several of the backup generator providers. Um, one of them, uh, the largest uh, that has in the residential space, has been growing at a 10% compounded average growth rate for the last decade, based on the on the number of, of severe uh, outages that have been experienced across the country. Uh, they've now been incorporating uh, not just uh, stationary uh, backup units on uh, that largely are based on natural gas. They've moved into energy storage because they've seen what some of the energy storage companies have been doing in terms of their uptake in the residential. Uh, and, and in some cases, commercial uh, customers uptake of batteries as backup uh, power for uh, for meeting resilience needs and reliability. So uh, there's certainly a factor there that we need to take into account. Uh, and microgrid development is really expanding in a number of areas for the same reason. So uh, it's certainly a factor that needs to be considered. And then as we think about advanced distribution designs, uh, that is alternative grid configurations that may be employed, which there's a lot of research going on both in the industry and in the national lab community thinking about that. Um, but also what's happening with utility microgrids as we think about microgrids as an alternative to just hardening, are there ways to think about communities um, at the community scale, not just for an individual customer, but whether we're talking about a neighborhood or a larger community-based microgrid um, as a way of, of providing additional resilience or reliability for, for that area that otherwise might only have one line feeding into, uh, into a particular uh, area that might be fairly susceptible to um, some event. Next slide, please. Uh, so as we talked about, there are multiple planning efforts involved with distribution planning. And if we go back to that pyramid, of, of uh, different uh, investment types and, and, and the kind of technology that might be employed, one way to think about it is where does asset management tend to focus? And that's on things like safety and electric code compliance and aging infrastructure replacement. Uh, where does reliability and resilience planning fit, which tends to go to the rest of the stack. So it tends to look at aging infrastructure. It looks at uh, design best practices. It looks at distribution automation. It looks at what is the very uh, more sophisticated um, kinds of uh, technologies and automation that may be employed, which tends to be the focus of grid modernization. So we have in reliability and resilience planning a, a pretty wide range of solutions or investment types that could fit and a lot of overlap with other kinds of planning that we showed and talked about yesterday. Um, and that's illustrated in the pie chart. And the takeaway from the pie chart is that Really, other than the public works, which uh, with that, what public works represents there is where you're relocating a pole from one side of the street to another uh, because of, a, say, uh, street widening or the like. And there's a fair amount of that kind of work, as you probably know, uh, for a utility to do in a year. Um, that isn't really related to resilience or reliability planning. Um, customer service requests, and that's to get a new uh, service hookup. That typically doesn't really involve a lot of resilience uh, uh, planning. But the rest of it, whether we're talking about um, you know, the blue area, uh, the dark blue, or the light blue, uh, 
Uh, by the way, the shades of blue uh, relate to the pyramid uh, colors uh, over in the other diagram. But as you can see, the vast majority of distribution investments, one way or another, touches on the ability of the system to be resilient and also the overall reliability, but um, particularly the resilience of that system. So whether we're talking about new infrastructure and system expansion, uh, thinking about what gets uh, deployed, uh, built out, um, you know, if it's not built out it, to, to consider resilience, then that's an impact. So that's an opportunity to really think about it there. Obviously, grid modernization, storm repairs are an obvious area. We're not putting out like for like, but are there opportunities to put out something new that uh, in a new design that is more resilient? Uh, aging infrastructure, we just talk about. Uh, certainly, the resilience and reliability categories there um, are critical areas to be thinking about. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an important consideration as we think about uh, distribution investment planning. Next slide, please. And as we touched on, there are a lot of solutions. So if I could have you focus on the lower right, um, that uh, two by two is saying, you know, trying to illustrate that we have lots of ways to try and address um, resilience uh, for a particular area, whether we're talking about uh, uh, solutions that try and address for all customers or uh, down in the lower, uh, lower left, just an individual customer where it might be just a backup generator. Um, and, you know, whether we're looking at trying to impact society at a larger level or whether we're looking just at a point solution, like a, just a single customer microgrid for a critical facility or uh, whether we're trying to talk about multiple backup generators for all critical facilities or something that addresses all critical facilities and, and, and all what's, whatever might be deemed essential services. Uh, or we're then talking about community-based solutions, which might include things like community microgrids or uh, grid investments themselves uh, and a combination of these things. It gets quite complicated when we think about, um, you know, what is this overall portfolio that might make sense uh, and how as regulators do you incorporate uh, the consideration of these when uh, customers are actually doing their own thing uh, in many cases, or there may be legislation that requires them to do something uh, if they're a particular type of uh, commercial or institutional facility. Um, so, how do we take this into account? Um, what we've been thinking about is that it's important to think about this as a portfolio of potential solutions so that we can think holistically about what the role of the electric grid is in enabling these, uh, these capabilities. Um, so uh, that, that there's an opportunity to think about the structural uh, aspects of this. Um, and then is there in, in some, you know, the application of architectural and engineering analysis to really understand how, as you make these changes, are you improving the overall resilience? Certainly, we think about things in economic terms, but we believe that there's an opportunity to think about this in the context of the engineering uh, analysis to, to look at resilience. One of the challenges right now is that reliability economics don't really apply here. Um, it's really, as you may have heard from Joe Edo yesterday, uh, we're really trying to think, and Joe and, and, and Pete Larson from Lawrence Berkeley Labs and others are really trying to understand and think about resilience economics. And so how do we apply that to this, um, to this uh, process as well? Thank you, next slide. Now, one of the things, and Joe will talk more about this, but one of the things as we think about these different kinds of events and the size of the events, uh, whether we're talking about a local event or um, you know, something still local, but a pretty, pretty big uh, within a state, or we're talking about a multi-state regional event, uh, we're gonna have different folks wanna be involved, different stakeholders, uh, that'll be involved as we think about these things. Um, and uh, so it's an important to really, uh, certainly from as utilities would look at this, but even yourselves, you know, who, what are the roles and, and responsibilities and coordination that ought to be considered in an integrated resilient distribution planning process? Today, we think about integrated distribution planning processes as relatively narrow. There's a few st stakeholders involved, the consumer advocates, your, obviously yourselves, the utility, uh, maybe DER providers, um, there may be some other folks, but when we start to touch about and, and incorporate resilience dimensions, there's a whole range of other folks that start to have a, a pretty, uh, you know, uh, pretty strong interest in, in, uh, in understanding how this uh, is incorporated. So one of the, one of the things we think about is how do we how do we do that, but not burden necessarily the ongoing annual and uh, maybe biannual. Uh, distribution planning processes that otherwise you'd be running. So 
uh, how do if you do this outside, how do you then, uh, as a separate effort in terms of stakeholder engagement for resilience and threat assessment, how does that then feed into this process, uh, into the process, I should say, of integrated distribution planning? Next slide, please. So, um, in, in kind of wrapping up, uh, there are a number of considerations to, to think about. Uh, the majority of distribution grid assessments, as we showed in the pie chart, affect the system's physical and or cybersecurity resilience capability. So, it's really important to be thinking about resilience in this context because uh, what gets built out as part of those long-term distribution or, or annual distribution plans will definitely affect that resilience. And so, how have those uh, potential threats that you might identify in your area uh, be assessed and translated into planning considerations into both the short-term and the longer-term uh, plans. Uh, is there a logical, you know, clear logical explanation of how proposed investment directly or indirectly supports resilience? Uh, the second bullet there. Uh, the third bullet, is there sufficient transparency in the distribution planning process to understand how resilience uh, is being addressed and, and reflected in those plans. Uh, so for example, do you have a separate threat assessment and how is that being incorporated? Uh, how are things like uh, <clears throat> microgrid or, or more particularly uh, customer adoption of uh, backup generation, uh, much as we look at things like forecasts of, of solar PV or, or storage, how do we think about backup generation or storage from a resilience standpoint? How are those being factored into forecasts? Uh, obviously, it doesn't necessarily impact demand, which is typically the, the focus of forecasts, but how are we taking these other forecasts that might be quite important uh, to thinking about resilience? How are those being incorporated? Um, how are we thinking about grid investments in the context of customer or independent solutions like microgrids as part of an overall resilience portfolio? Um, obviously, the utilities may not be fully informed of what's going on in terms of what customers are doing behind the meter uh, in terms of all of what they're doing. But is there a way to think about those forecasting and what, what is the best way to be balancing uh, what the customer may do in terms of creating their own solutions versus what may be needed uh, on the grid side? And how do you think through those issues? Um, and as I touched on, are all the key stakeholders from a resilience planning standpoint, or at least the threat assessment, uh, are they all involved in an impact an effective engagement process to really understand the implication of the electric distribution system on their operation, on their, you know, their uh, mission critical functions. Next slide, please. And with that, um, quick poll. Uh, so integrating resilience considerations into the distribution planning process is not necessary as that is a separate planning effort important uh, resilience factors into most distribution investments necessary to evaluate distribution investments and to enable the best plan and optimal um, uh, expenditures on uh, infrastructure or um, both b and c both important because the factors into distribution investments and necessary to evaluate distribution investments going to give everybody a moment to answer. All right, we're going to close the poll. All right. Yeah, B and C. Thank you. I think that's our, uh, I think that might be my last slide. Thank you. Great, thanks Paul, excellent. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Um, essentially, um, there, there may be a large uh, commercial customer, maybe a big box store that uh, may have its own backup generation um, and, um, when they are forced to use backup power due to multiple power outages in the system, the utility sometimes comes back and says that um, it's happening because of installments of poor protection systems 
on the commercial side backup power and it doesn't support the utilities protection criteria, how would you go about addressing this situation? Well, I think in that case, um, I mean, the simple answer is I would get an independent engineer to evaluate that um, because that's really the only way, you know, that, that's, a, that's a protection engineering question and, and really you'd need somebody with a expertise in protection engineering to basically evaluate the settings on both sides to see if that in fact is the case. Um, but I mean, without understanding a little bit more about what the outage history of that particular um, circuit that's feeding uh, other equipment, that uh, there may be a tap line or, or the like, um, say fuses blowing, um, that are feeding that that big box store. Um, you know, you can start with that and see how that correlates with the the number of uh, in, um, times that the the big box store has to operate their their system automatically. Um, absent that, then the you know if that doesn't show anything conclusively, then I would have an independent engineer, um, you know, evaluate that. And I think it's I think it's you know the the utility ought to be you know uh, in, the utility ought to engage somebody to take a look at that um or you know if it need be the big box retailer you know could do that but i, I think you'd want to have somebody come in and give an independent view uh, a view with that thank you um one more question um are there any types of distributed energy resources that could improve resilience to cyber and physical events um, well, what people are looking at are the potential for solar plus storage, um, you know, as a as a way of thinking about. Um, actually, it's kind of an interesting exercise if you if you have a, a little time to do it. Um, and, and this is not promoting any particular um, company, but um, Tesla's website has a pretty cool little tool that um, if you're trying to understand how many days out that you want to protect for your size home and you put in how many square feet and that sort of thing. Um, it will tell you how much solar uh, you might put on your house and then how many backup batteries you might need to be able to withstand, let's say up to three days or four days or five days. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it can tell you, you know, what that might mean. It also gives you a cost estimate. And it's, it's a helpful way to really understand if in fact some of these things are really gonna be practical for a lot of people. I mean, it's possible you can do, but like in my own case, when I was trying to think through how am I gonna get through some of these preventative power shutdowns where I live that were you know, four days in duration, um, and I, I took a look at the website and it said I needed five batteries and it cost me $65,000. While technically it's possible, economically that was completely out of the question. So um, I think, that you know going through some of those little exercises some of those tools really kind of gives you a feel for you know what the art of the possible is that's not to say that if we're talking about one day or two um i think some of these things are quite appropriate um but then i think we need to think about you know what's the role of the grid because if people can only afford say two battery packs that gets them through two days then day three uh and if it's overcast they're not going to they're not going to be able to to make it through, you know, you know, beyond day two. Then, then we need to think about what the grid's role is in that context. That's where this gets a bit nuanced and a little more sophisticated. Thank you so much for your presentation and your expertise on this session.